You're off the grid or do you sell back to the utility company? Uh, the Energy Farm is an off-grid facility uh, focused on uh, bringing out the technology and practicality of the energy loop that exists on the farm, as you had alluded to. I think there's a lot of synergy in bringing the technologies together and smaller diversified farms, as farms have classically been, uh, have a lot more potential to utilize that energy loop than specialized larger facilities. But the, the farm I have is, is off-grid over four years. Um, the, the power lines run by. Uh, we have wind and solar, biodiesel crushing, and our renewable energy interns are working on, on our big digester uh, this summer. What do, you, what do you feel like your savings have been over that the four years? Self-reliance mm -hmm. is my savings. I don't, I've never quantified it, but uh, the, the fact that we can do it and show other people how it may or may not fit for them or one aspect of it, uh, the satisfaction that it brings, I think, in, in showing people that it can be done as a demonstration project is, is the value. Mr. Barn, well, tell me more about the education process that, uh, and other members of the committee that, uh, that you've gone through, whether it be in the schools or just educating the public or, you know, even from the bumper stickers. Right. <clears throat> Well, a big, a big challenge for us is, is getting people to understand that these fuels that we're talking about don't require any special equipment. They don't require, uh, people assume that when you start talking biofuels or biodiesel, that they need to go out and buy some new equipment, some kind of new engine. They have to have their, their, their car modified, their truck modified, or, or so on. Um, so a big part of it is just getting the word out there through, uh, we, we do a lot of uh, talks at uh, conferences and festivals and so on in the Western North Carolina region in particular, um, and in the schools, uh, the, the universities, going in and just talking about um, both the, the value of biodiesel in terms of the, um, the net energy output that comes from it, and it's, it's, it's very high. It's about 3.5 units of energy for every energy unit input. Um, but also the fact that you can simply put this straight into your existing diesel vehicle. So whether they're um, truck drivers or, or um, folks with a Mercedes or Volkswagen diesel car, or uh, like I said, we have fire trucks and, and uh, landscaping equipment at the Asheville airport running our fuel. Um, but just educating these folks and these fleet managers so that they understand not only can they just run this fuel in their existing equipment, but um, it's actually better for their equipment. It's a higher, it's a higher, um, um, uh, quality fuel in terms of its lubricity and other properties. So um, the, the bottom line comes down to price almost always. And if you can just, if, you, if we can provide a product comparable to uh, petroleum diesel, which we have been able to do over the long haul, um, and, and in some cases we're actually slightly under petroleum prices in, in Western North Carolina, some of the lowest priced uh, biodiesel in the country, um, people are very willing to, to accept that and adopt that. And we, we find that you know, people do it for a number of reasons. Some, it's, it's purely environmental. They want, they want to have cleaner emissions and cleaner air in the mountains. Other people, it's, uh, it's more a question of national security and patriotism. They, they'd rather put fuel in their tank that's produced right there near their home from people that they know and keeping that money right there in their local economy as opposed to shipping those, those dollars off to the Middle East. So it's a number of reasons. I forget, what is the cost right now per gallon at the pumps? Um, well, we sell everything from um, B2, 2% 2 biodiesel, up to B99, uh, mm -hmm. essentially pure biodiesel. And it ranges, um, when you're in the lower blends, it's very comparable with petroleum, obviously, because it's mostly petroleum. Our, uh, our B99 right now is selling in, in, uh, in the Asheville area anywhere from 480 to $5 a gallon, which is right on par with petroleum That's diesel. Low. That's great. Um, Dr. Woolley, um, when we, you talk about the transformation, cellulosic uh, ethanol production and some of the problems and issues, I, I, I note that wood chips has always been, has, has been mentioned in many different ways. And we've we kind of seen how, uh, and there's, um, we've seen how the production from the corn standpoint has increased. And we had a hearing here, bakeries for an example, of using some of the, the food production. Will using wood chips increase um, lumber prices and cost of homes uh, if, that, if that goes into production, or is it a lower quality of wood that's being used? Well, uh, first is to, to um, help everyone understand uh, the, the feedstock. So wood uh, is, believe it or not, very similar in composition and, and structure to 
things like the corn stover and the, and the grasses that we talk about. So as far as the conversion technology, it's very similar and it just, you just have to grind it a little bit differently. Um, part of the challenge uh, around wood uh, and grass is that it's um, sort of the chicken and egg. How do I get somebody to commit to a large track of land for, for wood to supply to me? How do I get somebody to commit to a large track of grass to commit to me? So w one way, and I'm, I'm getting around to your answer, but one, one way to look at it is the, uh, using the agricultural residues, which are already there, they're not used for very much else, gets us so that we can develop the technology. Then we can move to, to wood feedstocks. Wood feedstocks are actually, uh, in some ways, better. They're, they're much more dense. You can haul them um, much uh, more efficiently down the roads in trucks. Um, and to answer your question about how will that affect the, the lumber industry, it depends on, on, on what um, sort of the economic position is of, of who's producing it. So if we, if, you know, and this is sort of secondhand information for myself, there are some areas of the country that, that have been uh, traditionally producing wood pulp. There's less demand for wood pulp. So those uh, stands of lumber are, or trees are underutilized right now. And so converting those and using those for uh, feedstocks for cellulosic ethanol uh, would have little, if any, impact on anything else. Um, and so it, there's also the ability to, to use um, more of the, the second, uh, and I'm not a lumber guy, so I don't fully understand it, but there's, pr there's certainly prime wood, the wood that you would like to have sure. for two by fours, and then there's secondary wood that's not, as, that's not as useful for that industry, which can be used in the cellulosic ethanol industry. So again, sort of that secondary um, um, wood that's not as useful for the prime industry. Mr. Trucks, if you, if you looked at one area, um, whether it be funding, policy, um, R&D, if you could have your wish list, what would it be for Congress to help uh, incentivize uh, companies such as yours uh, to be able to, to grow and, and, you know, give us the independence that we need, the efficiencies that we need, and the technologies that's, that, can, that can and are available? Uh, good question, I think. It's two parts. Two, two parts to that answer. One step you already took, the renewable fuel standard has a sort of a, a carve out for advanced biofuels. I think everyone here at the table qualifies under the advanced biofuels. It's a small sector of the policy right now, but I commend you for doing that because it's stimulated a lot of investment sitting here at the table. Make sure that stays in place because if it goes away, I think we all probably go away. Um, and two, it's the uh, extension, at least for my industry, the extension of the biodiesel uh, excise tax credit, broadly speaking, for these guys, it, whether it's the cellulosic credit or, or ethanol credit. It's absolutely critical because everyone really relies on private equity banks to fund this technology. Um, and you start giving unstable policies and they just pull back their money and they don't start up again next year when you change the policy. I was just uh, at an event for uh, Representative Sierra Rodriguez and one of the guys that attended started the Biodiesel Coalition of Texas. He was a, one of the major recipients of uh, CCC Bioenergy Program, which has been refunded. Started the whole industry really in Texas and he's now out of business because some Texas policies changed, some government policies changed, disappeared, came back. He expanded, policies went away, he had overextended himself because of the disappearing policies and now he's out of business. So uh, again, the sooner you can act to extend the excise tax credit for us and when you go towards perhaps the next Congress, look at long term extensions give investors the certainty to create new technologies and let us make partnerships with his company. He needs me behind him so he can go to a farmer and say, well, I'm going to buy the product from you. If it's Camelina, a farmer needs to know who's going to buy it if I grow it. See, we've got to create these partnerships. I can only partner. I can write the contract if you tell me, yes, here's what's gonna, what I'm going to have in, in a year or two years.